Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. It is a board gaming podcast about board games, and I'm here with my very good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm quite well, Walker. How are you? We're on the summer schedule. You never answer me. You never answer me. Well, I'm looking at my screen, Mark. I'm very, you know, i got to concentrate on this what I'm doing. This is supposed to be an interactive, is, dynamic medium. This is, you know, it's very, this is very difficult How are you doing? Tell me. I'm doing great, actually. That's Life wonderful. Life is good. That's wonderful. We got, we have Shucks coming up in October, where we're going to meet some of our, our listeners. That's exciting. Uh, auction number two has started, even though I didn't want it to start yet, because I just, auction number one just finished, but people decided to start bidding on stuff, so I had to... Push it live. Nobody can stand in the way of commerce. I know. I guess, you know, and this one's much better. All sorts of new games. Anyway, I'm not going to go on and shell out an auction again. Why stop now? All right. So this is what we're going to do, Mark. We're going to talk about the games we played this week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. Then we're going to talk about our feature game of the week, which is Edge of Darkness from AEG Games. So, Mark, what did you play this week? I played Tiny Epic Max again by accident. See, what happens is when people are discussing what you're going to play. Like again, again? Yeah, yeah. Don't go to the washroom while people are discussing what you're going to play because then when you get back, someone might be setting up Tiny Epic Max and somebody else who hasn't played it before might be an unwitting accomplice to your playing Tiny Epic Max again. I'm exaggerating. It's not a painful game. It's not aggressively unpleasant it's just pretty mediocre random and with some disconnects sure enough it was once again more a game about setting up turrets and having area control than it was about going around and doing cool things in a mech played with three this time as opposed to the first time with two and i commented that with more players i would imagine that you ended up in fights relatively accidentally and like the cassandra like prophet that i am sure enough when you're playing with more players a lot of the fights were just by accident it's like oh you're there I guess we're fighting now, which is fine because in Tiny Epic Max, everyone's just a point piñata anyway. The point of combat is to show up, do as much damage as you can, not because you care about anyone being damaged, but because you get tons of points every time you're engaged in a fight. So yeah, play Tiny Epic Max again. I feel sorry for you. That's all right. Mark, you and I got to play Yokohama. We did. Finally, you know, I played it a couple years ago and I asked you so kindly to get me the deluxe version and you did and it sat. And it sat, and finally, we got it out to play. This is a game that frequently gets uh, compared to Istanbul. I I don't I see the comparison, but it's really not that similar. It just does wonky things with you know in air quotes worker placement, but it's more like improved action selection because you only have really one worker, and you're putting out you know other mini workers, but they're really just tokens to power up his action. So it's just. You know, improving an action selection game is really what it is. But it's very interesting game because it's very random every time because you're randomizing all the map sections and you're randomizing the cards that go on those map sections. And it's pretty well get your resources, fill fulfill orders, and try to block and maneuver a little bit on the board. You know, like you were commenting, it's mostly accidental blocking, but you can sort of pin someone around and make them pay you. So it, it, I had a pleasant experience, just like the first time I played it, and I'm glad, and I'm more, I'll be more than happy to get to the table again. What were your thoughts on it, Mark? I thoroughly enjoyed Yokohama, but I felt it was somewhat of an uneven experience. I enjoyed the action selection. I thought it was very cute. I thought it exploited the spatial element rather well. That, I think, is what people are getting at when they compare it to Istanbul. Despite the fact that I'm a huge Rudiger Dorn fan, I have yet to play Istanbul. It's a very strange lacuna in my gaming experience. But anyhow... I like how the orientation of the tiles matters, where they are matters, you have to chain paths and so forth. The part that I didn't like was the accidental blocking. We actually commented during the game that it reminded me a bit of Le Havre, which is Uwe Rosenberg's somewhat divisive, uh, heavy-ish, maybe almost worker placement game. And, and the thing about Le Havre that I don't like, and prepare all your hate mail now, please, and send it to Air Canada is that most of the time when you're blocking, it's by accident because your worker just sits there. The one worker you have sits there and blocks people while you're doing other things. So you might just be doing the other things you need to do, blocking one of the two or three system integral buildings in the game, causing everyone else to go to a standstill, and it's not anything you did consciously. Or maybe it is something you did consciously. Either way, the game's at a standstill, and there's this weird bottleneck. In Yokohama, similarly, you cannot go to where anyone else is. 
And I did not see any solid strategic horizons for doing that consciously because you can't stay in the same place more than one turn. And so what we had at one point was this very strange turn order bottlenecking situation where player A went and blocked a, uh, blocked a, a, a location. So players B, C, and D weren't able to go where they wanted to go. Then player A has to leave and then player B jumps on it and player C and D are still out of luck because now player B's in their way, etc., etc., etc. That part was not awesome. And the other thing that I didn't think was particularly awesome was the game length. I thought it was a little bit longer than it wanted to be because, again, when it comes to Euro games, I really like clever action selection mechanisms, but as far as fulfilling orders through goods goes, you know, there are tighter experiences out there. I would definitely play Yokohama again. I enjoyed it, and I agree with you that I'd like to see different building setups, and that would probably change the contours of things rather considerably. The action selection was clever. The blocking element was only a minor, minor uh, fly in the ointment, as it were, or any other outdated idiom that you want to use. But all things being equal, I don't think it would rise to the top tier because of length issues. But I did enjoy it, and thank you very much for introducing us to Yokohama. I really wish the order cards were tiered, you know, means they got more difficult as you went along. There is a little bit of that build-up, because I don't like games that are, you know, you're just doing the same thing over and over again, right? Sure. There is a little bit of a build-up as you get your uh, technologies built up, and, you know, people tend to, you know, get to move around a lot more and do more things. But I think, I wish there was more of that, so i.e. a graduated order system or something like that, where, like, it ramps it much faster and makes it more interesting as you go along. I actually thought the technologies were relatively bland. This isn't even a criticism. It's just that the fundamental action selection in Yokohama says, here are the things you're not allowed to do. And then all the technologies are basically variations on, you can now do this one thing that we couldn't tell you to do before. Like, for example, show up where someone else is supposedly blocking you. And as a result, it, it, it didn't feel particularly novel to me. It didn't feel as nice as, say, the technologies in Sulkin or the technologies in Teotihuacan or the special powers you're going to get in Marco Polo, all three of which are examples of Euros where, you know, you have to go assemble these goods and fulfill orders in various ways. But at any rate, that's not even really a criticism, but again, just more contours on, on the uh, the order of things. And I really do think that the graduated orders might have been helpful, but I think mostly I would have preferred if the game were overall just a little bit shorter. And that is Yokohama by TMG yeah. Games. Got to play a favorite of mine, which strained my credibility, but nonetheless, man, I was redeemed in the end. This is Risk Mass Effect Galaxy at War Edition. Really, it's just Risk Mass Effect because there's only one... Risk Mass Effect. This is actually a reskinned version of Risk Original Trilogy Star Wars Edition, not the other Star Wars Risks. But I actually prefer the Mass Effect version for two reasons. Number one, I prefer Mass Effect, and number two, I actually think it's more thematically appropriate, especially given the victory conditions. It is a heavily asymmetric game, best at three players, where the victory conditions are radically different. The victory condition of one of the factions is to wipe out the other faction. A victory condition of another faction is to find a specific MacGuffin that is hiding somewhere in the more powerful faction. And then there's the third player who roughly serves to police the, the balance of power, whose job it is to grab a whole bunch of resource-specific uh, planets. And the system encourages you to go after everybody, and it inter it's one of those three-player conflict games that internalizes the Kingmaker problem, because everyone has to police everybody else. You have to be in a position whereby you need to be able to have a, the ability to threaten everybody at any time, both because you need to do that to get resources and because that's just how the victory conditions work. People were very dubious, people were very skeptical, but by the end of the experience, some people had been won over. So once again, you're going to get funny looks. Well, that's always... Just that, like that, I'm getting now. That is No, well, that, I'm just saying that is always the way a Risk game goes. Like right. All of these really interesting, uh, when they add a cool mechanism or put a cool theme on it, but they... They, well, there'll be more on this later, right? Uh, there's a little news segment that sort of is... Anyway, moving along. Uh, when people hear Risk, they get very dubious and, and worried. And yes. rightfully so. Yes, but the the fundamental conflict resolution mechanism of Risk, the three dice versus two dice when you're attacking, I think is fine. And yes, it leads to some aberrant results on, on occasion. Of course, it's, it's die rolling, but what do you want? The other thing that I'd forgotten about Risk Mass Effect, because I hadn't played it in a few years, was it has a weird cribbed version of Risk Express by Reiner Knizia buried in the game. You, it just has these cards for basically what is Risk Express, 
that you can play independently. Or, if you're dumb, you can play this weird version where before everyone's turn, they play a turn or two of Risk Express on top of what is normally a Risk game, which is not really good because it's just solitaire at that point and everyone else gets to sit and watch while you just go through the motion. So I, I don't recommend that part. But it was an odd edition, and that's why it's the Risk Mass Effect Galaxy at War edition rather than just Risk Mass, Mass Effect. But it's great. You get to conquer Tachanka, you get to wipe out the Geth Heretics, you get to do all these things. And more. And more in Risk Mass Effect. I actually sincerely recommend it if you want a relatively luck-driven, but nonetheless very enjoyable, very thematic, tight, interesting, asymmetric conflict game. That is Risk Mass Effect. Played another game of Pulsar 2849. I still don't know why it's called 2849. Please let me know. This is by Vladimir Suki at CGE. I commented before that I wasn't sure whether... It was kind of on the bubble. Isn't that, isn't that the year that it takes place in? Uh, I assume, but there's no explicit reference to that that I've found. Gotcha. Anyhow, one can one can imagine. I commented before very much in the context of Yokohama. You know, there are a lot of... Euros that have very, very interesting action selection or something like that, but you're not quite sure if that alone is enough to take it the distance and or to let it rise to the top of very crowded fields. And so I wanted to play Pulsar again to see whether it was going to descend into another morass of point salady type optimization games or whether it was enough to be whether tight or focused enough to stay in my collection. And I have to say that so far the indications are mildly positive. It helped, having played the game before, I was able to give a much better rules explanation, because Pulsar is one of those games where there's tons and tons of stuff, but there's not a whole lot that you need to worry about in terms of complicated subsystems. There's only one or two. The rest of it is very straightforward. Spend this die, do this thing. And it's it, it, Once you get that underway, once you set up the entire board, and you're able to explain things in sequence, it was actually relatively comprehensible, and people seemed to take to it very, very quickly this time, now that I knew what I was doing. And it was quick. It was a solid 75 minutes after the rules explanation. The rules explanation didn't take too long, and that is always in uh, something in its favor. And personally, I didn't feel like it was particularly point salad. It felt relatively focused. Your job is to get these gyrodynes spinning, and that generates you the bulk of your points. And the other stuff was mostly just stuff you do on the way, or other things that you can focus on when you're not quite able to get that primary goal across. And if that holds, if that continues, and if that able, if, if it's able to maintain its focus, then I really do think that Pulsar is a game that I'm going to be coming back to again and again, because I really, really like the fundamental dice drafting. It's so clever and cool and competitive, and it introduces a great element of player interaction that a lot of other heroes of its weight don't do. And so more excellent experiences with Pulsar 2849. Yeah, and I love the technologies that they have. It's much like what we just said, you know, where it just lets you do things that the game usually blocks you from doing, right? And makes, you know, your actions better, which is which is good. You know, it doesn't overpower the game. Right. I agree. So it was Pulsar 2849. Got to play a game called Antidote. Antidote is a relatively light deduction game by Dennis Hoyle. And I know a lot of people who like Antidote, actually. There's a number of casual gamers and even a number of more experienced gamers that are big fans of Antidote. Long story short, you randomly choose a suit at the start of the game, and then you start dealing out cards. And basically, the suit in question has one card missing. And you have to deduce which suit in question, based on a variety of transmutational powers, and I pass you a card, and you pass me a card, and I play a card out so everyone can see it, blah, 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 blah. And so you have to infer or deduce which card is missing from the deck. The problem is, for me, is twofold. Number one, I don't like deduction games. It makes me feel like I'm studying for the LSATs again, and I don't need standardized tests in my leisure activities. Number two... There's too much information to adequately process, and generally speaking, you're not going to be in a position to actually make a solid deduction. You just have to guess based on a probabilistic analysis of the sea of information you've, you've, you've gotten from. Even in the explanation of the game, though, they explain that by the end of the game, you're just going to have to go out on a limb because you probably don't have the necessary information, at which point you're basically admitting that this isn't a deduction game anymore. This is a risk-taking game with the veneer of deduction. So, no thanks. I'm not a fan of... Antidote. Antidote. <laughs> uh, I've uh, played it more than I care to, uh, but some people really like it, so that was my experience with Antidote. Got to play a game I'd been looking forward to for a very, very long time called Human Punishment Social Deduction 2.0. Just, you know, to indicate that well, that's, they... That's a nice short name. Easy to, easy to search on BGG and 
it also indicates that the developers don't think too highly of themselves. Okay. You know, a, a nice humble title like social, uh, like he, social deduction 2.0 to indicate, oh, we've just reinvented a genre. It's not, it's no big deal. Especially since, and here's my hot take on human punishment after having played it three times. It's not really a social deduction game. There's a bit of it. There's a bit of social deduction, but then what happens is after people have drawn battle lines, it then devolves into a take that game. Now, as far as take that games go, it's relatively okay because the powers are super crazy and fun to use, and the art is very nice, and I can give you the the anal- the uh, artistic evaluation is offered by a seven-year-old boy of our acquaintance, which is, wow, cool, wow, cool, wow, cool, followed up by, why are the bosses the least, thing- least cool thing in the game, wow, that rocket launcher is cool. Anyway, so that's the evaluation from a seven-year-old boy, and for what it's worth, I think he's mostly right. So, what does that say about me? I don't know. I, if you want to take that game, sure. I, but, th- honestly, I was hoping for a social deduction game, and I didn't get one. This is the kind of uh, gamer who plays the Resistance and then plays Secret Hitler and says, well, what if there was more randomness in the system? Uh, well, they said it was going to be 2.0, so I can see why your, your expectations were so high. Yes, as a number of people have commented to the Board Game Geek, if this is the future of social deduction, I'm very happy to remain a dinosaur. I'd rather, again, under the aegis of deduction, I'd rather have information upon which to deduce rather than a whole bunch of wild crap flying all, all over around me. But, you know, you say that, and we say that, and I say that, but then we we see the popularity of Ultimate Werewolf, and and I wonder... I will say this. In Human Punishment, it is possible for your allegiance to change, but you at least know. You know when it changes, and you you always know what you are at the very least. That is one definite okay. advantage. Wow, that at least, yeah, that's a step above anyway. Well, but what it made me remind, what it reminded me of though, is that I really think that the take that genre has been done to perfection by Jim Felly at Devious Weasel Games with Door the Lesser Houses. What Door the Lesser Houses recognizes is that to make a good take that game, you don't need wild cards. You need a solid system upon which to build unmitigated spite, malice, and acrimony. And then good times will be had by all. It's true. And right off from the beginning, there's like no holds, you know, there's no pretending it's anything else, but you're going to mess with everybody else at the table. Exactly. And when you're brought down and when your face is being ground into the dirt, you know it's because people put you there, not because some card effect seemed outrageous. Right? Again, exactly. I like Cosmic Encounter. I like some games with wild effects. But at the end of the day, when you've shown me that that you can get that, take that uh, excellence without wild card effects, and then show me what is ostensibly a social deduction game with wild, take that card effects, I, I don't really see what the point is, honestly. So if you like Take That Card Games, fine, maybe, but it really wasn't for me. That having been said, it was very popular at the table, and people were laughing at the the, the insane, incredibly powerful card effects and enjoying the wildness that ensued. I, and it's been requested again, so I'm, I'm probably going to play it some more. I'm sure all the defenders are going to crawl out of the woodwork and say, Oh, but Mark, you just don't understand. You need to play it some more. I, I need to have, I need to understand the subtlety and the beauty. I just don't get it. I'm not playing it right. Please send all your comments to feedback at aircanada.ca. Anyhow, so I'll be playing more Human Punishment. I will be seeing if I'm ready for the next generation of Social Deduction games. More on that to follow, but that was Human Punishment Social Deduction 2.0. Finally played Villagers. Villagers is a drafting tableau builder game, which is to say it is a hyper generic Euro. It's very, very light. The... Hook, ostensibly, is the sort of promotion system whereby first you play a card and it's level one, and it can be promoted to another card, and it can be promoted to another card after that. And that's fine. The problem is, all of these cards come out of a random draw deck, which is a subset of a very large card pool, even if you're playing at the max player count. So, if on round one or two of the draft, you start on the level one leather worker, maybe the level two leather worker will show up. Maybe they won't! And maybe if it shows up, somebody else will draft it. Maybe they won't. Anyway, I'm exaggerating the effect of luck in the game. It's just when a game is this light, and when in Villagers all you're doing is just drafting and playing cards, I'm looking for something that at least exploits the hook or exploits the uniqueness. There isn't really hate drafting. That's what we look for often in drafting games. There's no real sense of building infrastructure, really, because very often in the early part of the game, you just want to be able to increase your draft capability, and then you segue into making points. So that's fine. 
but I wasn't a huge fan of how this promotion element depended entirely on the right cards coming out, and even sometimes the right cards coming out in the right order. It was quick and relatively inoffensive, but nothing really grabbed me about Villagers. I keep getting confused. There's so many Village games. There's The Village and Village and The Villagers and... I cannot keep them straight, Mark. I'm well, this so one, simple. this one, Walker, is Villagers, and you can keep it tracked by the excellent publisher name, Sinister Fish Games. Sinister Fish. Yeah, I'm I, I'm a fan of the publisher name. I love it. And those are the games we played this week. And on to the news now, and why it doesn't matter. Very early preliminary news now, but there's an expansion to Sidereal Confluence in the works. Sidereal Confluence, a trading and negotiation in the Elysium Quadrant, to give it its full ridiculous title, is still my favorite negotiation deal-making game. And apparently, Tau City Dykeman, who wasn't satisfied with presenting you a beautifully realized science fiction universe with nine mechanically distinct, unique races, has decided, you know what? We need nine new factions and a whole bunch of new technologies and a whole bunch of new planets. Early days yet, based on how I know that the initial development time of Serial Confluence was incredibly prolonged, I can optimistically expect this this expansion, if it's ever published, to probably hit shelves about 20 years from now. But I am very enthusiastic to hear about any and all developments in that score, because I still maintain that Serial Confluence is one of the best designs of the past five years. And I always like to play it, even though no one wants to play it with me, and by no one I mean Walker. And that 18 races. Well, that'll be 18 races that I don't have to play. That's sweet. Now, speaking about games that are going to take forever to come out, there's going to be a New Orleans, Mark. And this sounds kind of exciting because we just talked about how games are not utilizing this interesting bag building uh, mechanism that we want to see more of it. And bam, here we go. Orleans Stories. It's uh, The base game is going to be come out with two stories. It looks like one's like sort of like a beginner thing. So you're like, you know, making your little village and it's more concentrated on like sort of like building buildings and stuff like that seems very interesting but the problem is as with uh all D- dlp games they did alta plano and they did you know uh, orleans is that we have to wait for a north american distributor to pick it up you know uh for orleans it was tmg for alta plano it was renegade games so who knows who's going to pick up this game so all of our friends over in europe will get to play it for the next two years but we'll have to wait for about three years before we'll get to see it. So, there you go. Orleans Stories, looking forward to it. It's pretty much a given that it's going to get distribution. And the the, the, delay, is, the but... delay for Altiplano was not considerable, you have to admit. Renegade got it over pretty quickly. And given the success of Orleans in the past, I have to imagine that it's going to be a priority. The one comment I have about Orleans Stories is... Do we really have to involve a campaign in every single game now? Yes. Is any genre safe? And from solo the, mode. Yeah, yeah. Well, like solo mode, whatever. That's That's been around in the hobby for a very long time, and it usually doesn't detract from the central experience, but I am just, ugh, I'm so sick and tired of campaign modes. I just hope that it's only going to be a campaign in the same way that, say, Thunderstorm Quest has campaigns, by which they simply mean, here are four completely independent scenarios that we've linked with some bad fluff text. Well, I, I think that's what it's going to be. And the fact I that hope. they say it comes with two really leads you to believe that there are going to be many expansions and or, you know, expansions right away. And both games are, are designed by Reiner Stockhausen, the same guy who did Orleans. So I'm sure we can expect good things. We talked last week about how there was going to be a Hansa Tonica big box, but there is more news for Andrea Stedding in the works. There's going to be an expansion to Gugong, which is another recent Euro that Walker and I are both big fans of. People at the Game Brewer are going to be running a Kickstarter. I believe the intention is to launch it in September for an expansion. You can get the incredibly deluxe version that they put out, or you can get the base game, and they're going to have new stuff for Gugong, new modules to change up the game, new techs, new benefits, new buildings, all the all the standard stuff that you would expect of a Euro of its ilk, and I am looking forward to seeing what they do with Gugong. Nice. Spoke earlier about, you know... Having, you know, risk associated with this game bringing bad thing. Well, Pandemic is doing something about that. Because of all these Pandemic games coming out, they've decided that they're just going to tag a line on the, you know, bottom of the box and they'll say this is using the Pandemic system. And that way, you know, they can, you know, do all sorts of different things with the name instead of having Pandemic in every name and maybe alienating some people or, you know, people that say, okay, I've had enough of Pandemic, I don't want it anymore. You know, now they'll just be in the corner and they can call the box whatever they want. And they're going to start off because they're going to be reprinting the Cthulhu version and it's going to have this new pandemic symbol symbol on the bottom. So 
And they said they have all sorts of things in the works, so it'll be interesting to see what they do with this. Well, I don't care about the Cthulhu version, but they're going to be keeping in print Iberia, Rising Tide, and Fall of Rome, which, for what it's worth, I think Iberia and Fall of Rome are the best pandemic games, bar none. They were originally limited collector's series or something, and now they say that they're going to keep them in print, which is great. Generally speaking, though, I never really believe limited collector's editions. They will sell as many as they can, and then if they sell out, they'll either decide to do another print run, call that a limited run, or whatever. Introduce some new dongle to make it exclusive. But anyhow, I'm very glad that Iberia and Fall of Rome are going to remain in print. They've also announced that they're going to keep doing more regional variations in conjunction with the World Championships of Pandemic occurring at Shucks this year, in which neither Walker nor I will be participating. They sadly, however, announced that there's not going to be a unique Canadian version that they're going to do. Uh, but they could do a cool thing with beaver dams and igloos. Yeah, it's for precisely those reasons that I'm somewhat moose. happy that they've just, yeah. They're, they're Hockey <laughs> sticks, I don't know what else. Moving right along, <laughs> I'm very glad that the... Team. Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> in other news... The Successors reprint has finally hit Kickstarter, and I have to say, I've been, I've been complaining about the Successors reprint and the attitude of Phalanx, uh, uh, the Phalanx games, but I have to eat my words, because all the time, when in public they were being very, very dismissive about consumers' feedback, specifically about things like the back of the Taiki cards being ahistorical and weird, the map being rotated 90 degrees so north up wasn't north anymore, which is somewhat disorienting for, for, for a lot of maps, and also didn't match the orientation of, say, the mountains that were represented on, on, on the board. All these things have been changed. So when people were issuing feedback for this and other things, like wanting there to be cardboard standees as well as plastic minis for people who don't like the plastic minis, and the response was, minis are better, shut up. But they were clearly taking notes behind the scenes, and the it looks like a very, very good production. The We're getting cardboard standees, the map has been fixed, the Taiki card back has been fixed, etc., etc. Look, if you don't like minis, you don't like minis, and so there's going to be that issue as well. There's a weird metal ring for the usurper. It looks like something out of a cereal box, frankly. But, you know, then again, I'm sometimes weak against props. I remember the Junta dice game, which had these incredibly cheap sunglasses that you're supposed to wear while you were El Presidente. And I was I was somewhat weak to that. I don't know if Successors is, you know, a, a four-hour multiplayer historical war game is necessarily the same kind of experience, but I'm willing to keep an open mind, especially since they've been so receptive to feedback over the co- past couple of months. So I've pledged, I'm looking forward to it being in print again. It is a fabulous game. It's my favorite historical war game. I suggest you you take a look. Uh, some of the marketing is still a little bit dubious. They seem to be trying to pitch it as, you know, say, ruining friendships for, for for 20 years, which is absurd. It's not a backstabby game at all. It's actually caused some confusion on Board Game Week already, people showing up and saying, so how much negotiation is in the game? And I can tell you, as someone who's played this game a lot, hardly any. You know, no more than Cthulhu Wars, for example, or no more than a game of Risk, or no more than any of those things. If your group wants to negotiate, they can. If they don't want to negotiate, they won't. Successors is a marvelous game. I can't say enough good things about it, and it was co-designed by the recently departed Richard Berg. I highly recommend it. Go take a look at the Successors reprint. It is on Kickstarter now. My little bit of news is Jagged Alliance. It was a fantastic computer game when I was a young lad. I have very fond memories of this. Of these, were well, there computers then, Walker? There was, you know, it was made out of sticks and mud, but you know, we we made do. Oh, wait, wait, you're, you're talking about playing Jagged Alliance on the Abacus, right? There you go. Anyway, that being said, there was a Kickstarter last year about with Jagged Alliance. I really wanted to get in on it, but I was a little dubious. But apparently it's done well, well enough that they've announced a, another expansion for it called Underground. So it's going to introduce all these sewer systems and all sorts of... Jagged Alliance is a... I don't know too much about the board game, but the video game was all about hiring all these mercenaries, trying to clear up this, you know, faraway land from being, you know, run by a tyrant. And, you know, all these mercenaries, and, you know, you run this big mercenary you know, gearing them up and having all sorts of fun. Anyway, I'm very much wanting to hopefully someone in the area will pick up this game because I wouldn't mind giving it a try. And the news is just the fact that, you know, it must be doing well for them to uh, be putting out another expansion for it. Jagged Alliance Underground. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our feature game, which is Edge of Darkness, designed by John D. Clare and put out by AEG of this year. It was put out after a successful Kickstarter. There's news of them having a reprint Kickstarter relatively shortly. There's there's already one expansion because it's a Kickstarter, so of course. 
John D. Clare first designed Mystic Veil vale in 2016, where he debuted this card crafting system whereby you have Mylar inserts that slot into sleeved cards, so a card could change over the course of the game. It might start off with having no effects, but then you can increase, give it up to three more effects. The same fundamental, let's say, publishing technology was used in Custom Heroes, released the year after that, also by AEG, whereby it was a game very much like President or A-Hole or what have you, whereby it was a climbing game, a multiplayer climbing game, where you could increase or decrease the numerical value or give a card a special effect by inserting more inserts. Uh, He also designed Space Base, which is the science fiction, Machi Koro-esque sort of role and everyone profits game of 2018. Now, rumor has it that Edge of Darkness was actually his first suggested design, and AEG's response was, why don't you take about 20% off the top and we'll start with something simpler. And that, so Mystic Veil and Custom Heroes were kind of test runs for the card crafting system, perhaps both on a publishing level and maybe also on a mechanical level. And Edge of Darkness is his fully realized vision. And AEG has talked about how this was... This is one of their most ambitious games yet published. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Edge of Darkness? Interstage right. All-encompassing evil. Interstage left. Human's last hope. Four guilds of Aegis. Thank God all hope is not lost. Surely they will work together to overcome this threat to humankind. No, I'm mistaken. They will actually fight it out. Because... Because only one can face this evil. (laughs) Alone. Because the book says so. So yes, there's four guilds in Aegis, but this they can't work together to fight this evil coming in, so they have to fight. So there's only one left, then they're going to fight the evil. Uh, Edge of Darkness is a deck builder, where the hook is that you don't actually, you as you build your deck, you don't get them immediately into your discard pile. They're going to go out into the world. They're going to make you some money, maybe. Things are going to happen, and they'll eventually make it back into your hand, and then you'll get to use them. It's the typical thing where there's a card that's going to get you money. There's a card that's going to get you more workers. There's a card that's going to let you claim more cards. And there's going to be a card that lets you fight. And that is edge of darkness. So I know you like to start with the positives before working its way into the negatives. And let me let me lead with this. And this is by no means a trivial thing. It may sound like I'm damning with faint praise, but I, but I mean this sincerely. It is hard to make an unpleasant deck builder. Deck building, the fundamental feedback loop of deck building is pleasant. And that I think is one of the reasons why you see so many of them. It is like worker placement by itself doesn't make a game compelling or satisfying. You need something on the back end to make it actually worthwhile. But the fundamental loop of getting new cards or improving cards in the case of Edge of Darkness or any card crafting system, and then watching your deck develop or watching your hand develop or what have you, it lends itself a natural arc. You get to feel a sense of progression even when you're not winning. It lets you try new things and have a sense of variety because it is Uh, almost any deck builder worth its salt has the requisite card variety. And as a result, I can say with certainty that Edge of Darkness doesn't mess with deck building enough to make it unpleasant to even go through the motions. It still has that same, despite the fact that it changes a lot of the the parameters of a deck builder, and we'll get into some of that, but not all of it, it still has that fundamental pleasant feedback loop of a deck builder. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah, for sure. There's like, uh, there's uh, 10, almost like, Every other deck builder, there are 10 cards that you're going to be able to pick from or more like abilities that you're going to be able to slot into the cards. And, and there's all sorts of different unique ways they're going to work together, right? And they give you, they give you different scenarios that you can set up and very distinct, you know, different strategies that you need to imply to get, you know, to get to where you need to go. Anyway, I'm just going to go over the game very quickly. So as we talk about things, that way people can sort of piece together how this works. So everyone starts with four cards with their house color on them. And then eventually you're going to, you know, claim more cards. But at the beginning of your turn, you're going to draw three cards and either they're going to come from your board that you've, you know, got from last turn, or you're going to draft them from the street. It's called, and everyone's going to draft from the street and everyone's going to take a turn drafting until they have three cards. And much like every other deck builder, you're just going to lay out your whole hand. So that's what they just say to do. You draft these three cards, you lay them out, and then you generate this thing called threat. 
you know, depending on how powerful the cards are, they're going to generate threat, which are going to be these cubes that are going to go into this tower, which we'll talk about later. And then once everyone's drafted their three cards, then everyone's going to take their turn where they're going to do all their actions. The first thing you do is you drop some cubes into the tower, and then if there's enough threat there, these monsters are going to attack. And if they don't, then you're going to do all of your actions and stuff. And there's all sorts of stuff that you can do is, you know, you, they come with these like very nice tokens that mark off your actions. They're going to get you more resources. They're going to interact with the board. And then you're also going to be able to draft a new ability into one of your cards that, you know, is in your thing, which is going to let you do that ability as well. And then your turn is over and it goes to the next person and you do this over and over again for eight rounds and then the game is over. So even in give your, I think, very useful summary of the phases of a round, one of the things I'd like to emphasize is my initial misgivings about Edge of Darkness when I was reading the rulebook. Because usually when there's a Kickstarter project and I'm a little bit uncertain about the designer or I'm uncertain about whether the Kickstarter is going to have enough exclusives to make it worthwhile or I'm uncertain about the cost, et cetera, et cetera. And I was very dubious of the designer. John D. Clare, I've commented before, has never had a design really come together before. I thought Mystic Vale was kind of an interesting proof of concept, but not really an interesting game. Custom Heroes, I thought, were on its welcome. And it was far too arbitrary because the cards you improve literally go out into the world and not, never come back to you necessarily. So it, it just ends up feeling arbitrary and you have no sense of ownership over any of it. And Space Base, I, I thought was, I, I don't really like Magic Core and I don't really like Space Base. Anyway, I was reading the rule book over the laborious setup and I started reading what happens in a round. And I kept waiting for where there were choices. Seriously, I was reading about, okay, this happens, then this happens, then you do this thing, and you set this thing over here, and the cubes go over here, and you lay out the cards and all these things. And I'm like, wait, when are you making choices in any of this? And over the course of a round, over the course of what happens during one of these eight rounds, most of the things you're doing are automatic. You just go on autopilot. And I don't mean that the choices are obvious. I mean that there are no choices to be had. Over the course of a round, you, you make literally two choices that are of substance. One of them is, what cards are you going to draft if you are drafting cards? But frequently what you're going to be drafting is somewhere between zero to three cards from the street, but the street is only six cards large. If you're drafting three cards from a six-card display, we're not talking about a whole host of options here. So you pay some to skip some, and that part's fine. You, know? you might not have anything to pay, so you have no choice there at all. Right. That, at least, we can say is your fault, or something. Yes. And then your hand more or less plays itself in almost all instances. You tend to have very, very, very subtle distinctions about how you might use a given effect sometimes, but usually it's relatively straightforwardly obvious. And so then you decide what it is you're going to buy, what new card you're going to take, the standard deck builder decision. But whereas in Dominion, and I'm not going to defend Dominion's economy to the hilt, but at least in Dominion you had to worry about how much money do I have, how many buys do I have, what should I be trying to trying to get. Edge of Darkness has decided to do away with all this. There's no notion of currency for the sake of, acqui of acquiring cards. You take whatever card you want. And sometimes I think that can work out okay. We've both praised Xenoshift and how it gets rid of buying money. And indeed, in Edge of Darkness, you don't have to worry about buying money, but you don't have to worry about marshalling your economic forces at all for the sake of buying cards. You just get the advancements automatically. So essentially what you do is you make a minor decision with drafting, which sometimes isn't a decision at all, and then you decide what new card you're going to put a slot into one of the cards. That's about it. That's pretty much the sum and substance of your choices in Edge of Darkness. Have I been unkind? Well, that being said, there is a little bit of, of decision into what card to put the new ability in. Like, are you going to put in... Are you going to put it into one of your own cards? Are you going to put it into a neutral card? Or are you going to put it into, you know, one of your opponent's cards that you happen to have drafted in front of you? So the, it's not a huge choice, but it, it, depending on the on the ability that you're drafting, it could it, it is sort of a little, a little bit of a, a decision. But it's a point. Every With very, very minor exceptions, in the course of dozens and dozens of different card effects that we've seen, there was only one effect where you might theoretically be inclined to slide, sleeve it into somebody else's cards. Because every time you put an advancement into a card, it gives one point to that owner at the end of the game. 100%. And so you put it in your own card. That's, that's the long and the short of it. And you want your cards to be good because if your cards are bad, they come into your hand more often, slightly more often, through a weird cycling thing, which we don't need to get into the details of. But that part at least is sometimes cute. But then why would you want your opponent's cards to be better and more efficient Agreed. Another good point is the fact that in Mystic Veil, vale, you're only dealing with the front of the cards. In Edge of Darkness, 
the cards are clear. So as you slot them in, there's also the back of the cards, which I found kind of interesting, right? The, all the backs of the cards are all the enemies that you're going to put up on the tower. They become the enemies. Not, we never actually like looked to see what we were drafting and we never actually looked up at the art of them. We'll get into that later, I'm sure. But I just thought the fact that they were, the cards were double sided was a fairly interesting part. Yes, it is. It opens up things, and as a result, the threats get more threatening as the game goes on because cards are being improved, and so that that kind of feeds into this whole notion of a game having an arc, which I generally like. The problem is, honestly, the the whole hunt aspect really felt kind of ancillary to me. It didn't really jive with the rest of what was going on. The whole notion of going out and killing monsters, as you articulated during your thematic explanation, it just doesn't seem to fit with the rest of what's going on. More Basically, the long and short of it is, if you're in a position where you can start a hunt, then you go and look at the threats that you might be able to kill. It's just a separate sideboard of points that you can buy. Yeah, that's what I wanted to jump in when you were talking about the fact that they took out the economy, right? You just get to pick a card, you know, they've done away with that, but then they introduce this thing where you actually have to have a card to start an attack. And it's like, why did they, you know, I'm, I'm just really wondering why they did that. I mean, it would have been just so much better if it's just something you could do during your turn. You know, if you generate that much swords and you could do that, then just do it. Why put in this whole mechanism where you have to have yet another card because we're going to get into it later, the fact that it's almost impossible to do anything. Everything's like a six-step process, yet another six-step process just to attack. Well, here's the thing, and this is one of my, my key criticisms of Edge of Darkness, because, again, under the aegis of things that deck builders do well, one of the things that you're going to get out of an average session of Dominion or Thunderstone or whatever classic deck builder you want, or even the ones we really, really like, like Xenoshift or like Core Worlds, you can count on the different card sets to give you lots of variety and really change the contours of what it is that you're doing. But in the context of Edge of Darkness, I think that a lot of the variety is really superficial and illusory because the core systems of the game have been offloaded onto card sets. And so if you look at the different card sets that are available, you're going to need one card to get you more agents because that's a core game system. So you have to have a card that does that. You need a card that is going to give you some defensive power. You need a card that lets you start fights. You ideally, though not necessarily, need a card that adds to your combat capability. You need a card that lets you claim more cards in the middle, because all of these are core game elements, not provided by the core game system, provided by, by the card set. So at that point, we're talking about five cards out of a ten-card set that are just going down a checklist. Now, they're all different, there are different ways to do this. There's the one that says you have to pay money to get a trained agent, or this other one that says you have to pay influence to get a trained agent, or this other one that says you have to play the card twice to get a trained agent. But at the end of the day, it's all amounting the same. So whether you have one card that starts a fight for money and one card that lets you sleeve for influence, or the card that lets you start a fight for influence and the card that lets you sleeve for money, what difference does it make? It's all just illusory detail on top of a system that is more complicated than it needs to be. And so you don't get the variety, and it leads to things being more cumbersome, and it seems like a tremendous wasted opportunity and a way to undermine some of the core strengths of deck building. True. Let's talk about how you get your cards back. Like this interaction of the cards of, you know, how they go out into the world and how they come back. So the cards that are provided in the game, they do it all sorts of different ways. Either you're going to sleeve a card in the on the street in the middle with your color, or you're going to sleeve one in in your hand. There's all different ways you can do it. So if you discard a well, card... Well, usually dictated by the card, right? It'll be the dictated card, by the, the card. The card will specify sure. whether you're allowed to sleeve in the street or, or, or sleeve in your hand. So it's not like you have a choice. It's dictated by what, the situation. Exactly. And then, so if you ever discard a card of your own color, it goes back to the common discard. So we didn't really explain that all of the... The entire deck is a common deck that everyone draws from. So if you play one of your own cards, it goes back to the common discard. If anyone else plays any of you, anyone else's cards, they go into their own discards. So at the beginning of their next turn, they come out as one of the three cards you get at the beginning of the turn. If blue plays a red card, blue has to pay money for every effect that they trigger. And then the card doesn't go to the discard pile. It goes to red's next turn's hand. Exactly. So... Once you start crafting a card, so whether you're crafting it in the middle or in your hand, then it's going to go, you know, into this common discard and you have to wait for it to come out onto the street. And then if no one else drafts it, then you will finally get it back in and have a chance to use it. But if you use it, then it's going to go back into the common discard again and who knows when you'll see it again. So it, you know, you are crafting your own deck, you are crafting your own cards, but the number of times you're going to get to play those cards is very limited, I feel. Did you ever feel a sense of ownership over 
anything that really happened over the course of the game? No, I didn't feel as though I was crafting my own deck at all, ever. Neither did I. I don't feel a, I don't tend to feel a tremendous sense of ownership over my own deck, but there are some exceptions. Particularly in, again, the excellent pure deck builders that we would like. In Core Worlds, some of the cards are really, really cool and they're, they're relatively unique. So you get to feel, ah, I have this, this unit that nobody else has and it's really neat when it triggers its effect. Whereas in Edge of Darkness, you're frequently messing around with other people's cards or the common cards. And so that really undermines any sense of ownership. Now, it increases player interaction and that element of player interaction is probably the most substantive element of player interaction in your average game of Edge of Darkness. The decision whether or not to draft some opponent's powerful card and pay them for its effects, that's a non-trivial element of decision space, and it does help influence your decisions about both drafting and card plays. So I shouldn't I shouldn't diss it too much. But as a result, you end up with a relatively you, you end up with a slightly more complicated card flow. Because one of the things that trips up new players of Edge of Darkness, we've taught this to a number of different people. And even people who are very, very experienced gamers are sometimes like, wait, where does this card go now? I this this does this effect doesn't make sense to me. There's a fair amount of procedural complexity in Edge of, Edge of Darkness. And again, hearkening back to my complaints about the relatively small amount of decisions you get to make Mostly, you're just wrestling with the system. You're not spending your time managing the levers carefully so as to get to the intended output. Most of the time, you're just trying to figure out how to pull the levers so you're following the, the turn order correctly and making sure that the card flow works according to the way that the Kabbalistic systems of the game make sense. Oh, and these are the cubes for this turn, and this is in the threat area and whatever. Anyway, so what you get as a result is a deck builder that's considerably longer than most other deck builders. I would, I would venture to say that under many conditions, this is even longer than core worlds and Xeno shift, which are already somewhat over long for what they are. But most of the time you're just wrestling with the system and that I do not find especially satisfying. Especially in this case, because you don't feel as though you're doing anything. Like we, I, you know, I started this, the thing where it has a story about these guilds and you're defending against this, this overall evil, but you never get a sense of that ever happening. Like there's a lot of, of card games out there or even deck builders where the mechanisms that you feel as though that is what you're doing, like the chainsaw goes through things and hits the next opponent or, you know, this things that make sense and, and put you in the game. None of these cards that I saw do this. And then we just both talked about how the fact that you're comp- always wrestling with the system where in order to do one thing, you have to do about six different steps. So when it's your turn, you don't feel like you're doing anything. But that being the case, you know, it makes for good flow because, you know, you you do your nothing and then it's the next person's turn to do nothing. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not being overly critical here. I just mean if you have people that know how to – know what they're doing, like know how to play, the game moves fairly quickly and you can get through those, you know, multiple phases to finally get around to what you want to do a little faster. So – because it does go around qu- – very quickly. I honestly think that some of it's down to graphic design issues, because this is another uh, uh, wasted opportunity I think that Edge of Darkness has. The art I really like. I really like the art in Edge of Darkness. It's also small though. The cards are oversized, but they have to accommodate the possibility of three different, entirely different cards. Effectively, you need to fit three cards worth of information on a single oversized card. So let's compare this to another AEG deck builder, Thunderstone Quest, or any of the Thunderstones really. In any of the Thunderstones, what you're talking about is, okay, I'm going to play my ranger and my ranger is going to equip this bow and I'm going to go kill a goblin. Not the stuff of Proust or of any, you know, shocking narrative or anything like that. But you tend to have lots of visual space dedicated to the art and you can get some idea of what's going on. In Edge of Darkness, strictly speaking, what I'm do, what I might be doing in any given case is I might be marshalling my holy knights to go out and using a ranger scout to find me where there's an arch fiend and then I go hunt the arch fiend and defeat it and get the reputation from the city for having defended that. But all of that is undercut by the fact that I can't read the title of the card that I'm playing, so I just focus on the icons. The Archfiend card is about three feet away from me on some weird overdeveloped plastic tower, and I can't read what it's called. So at the end of the day, I'm just squinting and saying, oh, that's worth two rep? Okay, I'm generating three combat to get my two rep. Which, again, is what you're doing in Thunderstone and other games like that. But at least there, it's not being dwarfed by the tininess of everything. And mostly, I feel, I I bring it up in this context, because mostly I feel like it's a wasted opportunity, and I feel bad for the artists who've produced so much art for this game that is reduced to tiny little microscopic levels and as a result you're just focusing on the icons. Like I say, yeah, all four players, their starting cards are all unique, different art pieces plus all the monsters plus all the cards. It's a crazy amount of asset art assets in this game. I want to talk about this tower, Mark. You know I hate this tower. I got to talk about the tower. So, long story short, 
you know, you generate threat, you put it on your board, next turn you take that threat, you put it on your cards, and then you put, drop the cubes into the thing, and then, you know, after a few turns, that finally, you know, one of them builds up to, you know, enough threat that it attacks somebody, and then it, and then they might defend or they might not defend, and if they don't defend, guess what? This little tower token goes down one space. So all of that cube stuff was, was all this build up for this one thing that is fairly meaningless. Like we've talked about how, you know, sometimes it goes down by a jump of two points. Plus, if you do successfully defend, you'll get one point. So it could be a difference of three, but so much effort goes into this, you know, giant tower, cubes, threat, and it's all just yet another mechanism built into this game to make it much longer than it needs to be. I think they would have done a much better job. This is one of those instances where I think loss aversion could have been harnessed to make it feel more consequential. The way the track works is your defense track starts out at 17, and after you've been whacked upside the head somewhere around 10 times, it goes down to zero. I think they would have been much, much better off if you'd started at zero, and every time you get whacked, you lose points. Now, it would have had the same game effect. It wouldn't have changed any of the decision space. It would have changed how it felt. It would have made being attacked feel more consequential, and would have helped the player experience bring that tower and all the monsters to feel like it was more a more integral part of the game, rather than just some ancillary thing that you could easily ignore. I've got something. I have something here, too. Since we're going to change the game. Okay. Let's, let's make it co-op instead, Mark. And these three pools are like the three different walls of the city. So you're like working together and you're trying to defend. It's like, oh, look at like red walls, you know, getting more cubes in there. So we have to, you know, they'd all be just a single color of cube because now it's a co-op game. But anyway, you could, you'd help each other out. It would bring you more into the game, like, you know, worrying about defending the city as opposed to just trying to get points. I think you're right. <laughs> I think that would have been much better if they'd stripped away a lot of the element, the ancillary elements, and they just focused more on this tower element and made the attacks meaningful. Then they could have made it a substantive co-op, and I think it would have brought things together thematically and experientially. Exactly. I, I, I really like this Walker cut of the game. I would pledge for your Kickstarter. Well, there you go. We talked about the setup and teardown. You said it's it's the same as any other deck builder, but it, it is a little bit more. Just because you have to un, at the end, you have to unsleeve all these abilities because it has all these little you know plastic things, and then every one of these cards also has a large cardboard card. So that's yet another step that you have to you know pull them out at the beginning and then put them all away at the end. Huge setup time, huge teardown time. Eh. I think it, honestly, I don't think it's that much worse than almost any other deck builder in existence. I mean, basically, so to sum up, basically, I think that what you're left with is in terms of most of the decisions you're going to be making, it's more or less a standard pure deck builder. You've got more or less the same level of decision making there. It's heavily luck dependent the way lots of deck builders are. There's not a whole heck of a lot of player interaction the way lots of deck builders are, but it's 30 minutes per player. And it's a huge amount of procedural complexity just to get at the same level of quality decision making you might have in any of the pure deck builders we've been playing for over 10 years. So I don't see the all this extra stuff, whether it's the tower, whether it's this element of the card crafting and all this other stuff, paying off for the tremendous amount of bloat that you're going to be managing. I would much rather play any of the standard deck builders that we like, or even any of the stripped-down deck builders that we've been playing for the past few years of the Realms ilk, because I think there you're going to get the same level of quality decision-making, but without all this extra stuff to say nothing of the increased price. All right, one more bad point before I do my sum up, and the fact that it has this awful victory point system of if you're winning, you win more. You always complain about that. I know, I just don't like it. I'm not saying it's a terrible thing. It's just it's a, it's a personal thing that I just don't like. It's not as bad as it is in Dungeon Lords, but it's still it, it's it, still there. Explain for people who don't remember what it is. Sorry, I shouldn't have cut you off. Please explain to people who don't remember what it is you don't like about it. No, it's, a, it's I don't know. It just rubs me the wrong way. Like in Dungeon Lords, like if you have the most you know, whatever, which is already getting you a huge amount of points. If you have the most, then you get even more points. So if you got the most points, you're getting even more. And I just, I, that kind of thing just bugs me for whatever reason. It's like, if you have the most workers, which gets you 10 points and you get even, you know, two more points on top of that, something about that mechanism just rubs me the wrong way. That being said, it seems to me as though they said, hey, we have this deck builder. How do we make it twice as long as it needs to be? Like they had some really interesting concepts here, but they seem to have tacked on all this stuff just deliberately to make it take longer than it needs to. 
This has nothing new that would get me to request to play it, and I would play any other deck builder over this game. I think at the end of the day, the card crafting system is still a gimmick in search of a good game. It's true, but that's the other thing too. They said they were going to introduce this uh, Mystic Veil so people get, you know, uh, used to this card crafting thing. But then they then the game, but Mystic Veil, you get to play with those cards. You get to build these like crazy combinations and get them to work. And now you bring out this game where I don't actually get to do that. It just seems odd. And that was Edge of Darkness <laughs> by John D. Clare and AEG. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E, not T-H-E-D-I-C-E. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you like the podcast, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.